and gentlemen, welcome to House of Sweden. My name is Monica Enquist and I'm head of the press culture department here at Embassy of Sweden. So welcome today. We are so happy that you're all here. And before we start uh, the event, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome you that have not been here before. And of course, use the opportunity to tell you a little bit what we are doing here at Embassy of Sweden. So House of Sweden is open for the public every weekend. We have different exhibitions that they can explore. And during the weekends, we have uh, seminars and concerts and literature readings and events like these. And maybe you saw an exhibition when you walked in in the entrance in Anna Lind Hall. It's an exhibition about uh, Swedish innovations and creativity. And uh, you will explore some of the companies that might come up today when you're speaking. We have one company that you will notice later on in the program, the Swedish Skype. And uh, that is one of the innovations that are mentioned in the exhibition. So if you didn't have the chance to look at it, please go up later during the network session and look at the exhibition. Because uh, Stockholm is second only to si Silicon Valley in the number of successful startups in per capita in the world. So sometimes we try to highlight that a little bit extra. Uh, here, as you see, we have a photo exhibition it's called Studio 54 Forever. It's by a Swedish photographer named Hasse Persson. And he was one of the few that were allowed to be there all the time. And he's described that era as a melting ball where everyone were, was welcome. It didn't matter what uh, their sexual orientation were or the race or age. So we try to highlight uh, that era and also the photographer Hasse Persson here. And now we are all here for this important dialogue about the digital future. As some of you might know, digital diplomacy is something that we have worked a long time with in Sweden. Uh, I don't know if you knew, but the first email conversation between two heads of government was actually be between President Bill Clinton and Prime Minister Carl Bildt, the Swedish Prime Minister. And in this email exchange that happened 1994, Carl Bill talked about testing the connection on the global internet system. And the President Bill Clinton replied that he was excited about the potential of emerging communication technologies. I think none of them could imagine where we would be 20 years later. Uh, how the digital innovations has been rewriting the rules of our economy, society, and the way we are living. It is not that long time ago that a phone was just a phone. And I remember cold winter days in Sweden when I was waiting for my brother. He is always late. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And you can sense how boring that is. But today, I think, people don't know how it is to just wait, to just be bored. We use every second of our life, and with our cell phones we can pay our bills. We can even market an event we are organizing, or send a video to our loved ones, or solve personal crises. And we have also seen how these rules have rewritten our way of working with digital diplomacy. If someone had told me before I started this job that we were going to have a Twitter conversation with the president one day, I think I would have had a very hard time believing it. Or if someone would, told, tell, would have told me that one tweet that we sent out were going to have a spread of 12 million people and retweeted almost 100,000 times, that would also have been a little bit of a shock. But we've done that, so obviously digital diplomacy is much, much bigger today than it was a couple of years ago. So today, some of our global challenges and goals are depending on the intersection of foreign policy and tech. And today we are going to address how to bridge the divide between policy and practice, innovators and diplomats, computers and humans, a talk of our joint digital future. So as you understand, this is an event where you're allowed to bring out your phone, snap a picture, share it on social media. And the hashtag is digitalfuturepd. And uh, 
the embassy handle is Sweden in USA. So please continue the dialogue there. And I will also use the opportunity when I have so many uh, creative minds in the room that after the event, I ask you if you want to be part of a selfie, or should I call it groupie, when we are so, so many here, uh, because today is the UN Day. And therefore, we would like to invi invite you all to join and take a stand for the Agenda 2030, Global Goals for Sustainable Development. And uh, we will do that after the panel. So if you don't want to be part of that picture and that uh, social media uh, campaign that we are launching now with just one picture, uh, then you can go out and start networking. So that will be after the panel. Now, I am so happy again that you all are here, and I'm happy tonight's event is a collaboration with Digital Diplomacy Co uh, Coalition and also with the USC Center of Public Diplomacy. And with that, let me introduce Jay Wang. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Monica. It's great to be here. Um, on behalf of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy, let me also add a welcome to all of you to today's forum. We are very delighted to present today's program uh, in partnership with the Embassy of Sweden and the Digital Diplomacy Coalition. And uh, special thanks to uh, Monica and Link uh, Linda at the Swedish Embassy for putting together this program. As many of you know, we are an academic institution based in Los Angeles at the University of Southern California. But we do come to Washington, D.C. a few times a year to convene discussions like this one and also to offer professional training programs uh, like the one, actually, it's on the back of your program notes that we are offering uh, our upcoming program in December uh, that uh, uh, look at uh, how we can reskill, uh, retool for uh, effective public diplomacy practice going forward. Now, today's event explores the impact of digital innovation on business and diplomatic partnership. When the two words, uh, digital and diplomacy, come together, there are generally two broad interrelated conversations. So the one conversation is very familiar to all of us, uh, which focuses on how do we develop and apply digital capabilities for effective public diplomacy uh, programs and activities. The other one is the road less traveled, I would say. That is, how is public diplomacy relevant? Or what does public diplomacy mean for the digital economy? and our digital future. And this is a topic we'd like to explore today. Digital innovation, um, you know, uh, uh, all the way from the Internet of Things uh, to uh, automation, to sharing economy, to the future of work, all these issues are calling for a new set of global public policies to facilitate our technological innovations and advances, as well as safeguarding the rights of our consumers and our citizens. To successfully navigate this fast-moving, ever more complicated transnational policy arena requires unprecedented international cooperation and a cross-sector collaboration. For instance, the private sector, both the tech firms and the non-tech firms, because these days, every company is a technology company in varying degrees. So the private sector and the diplomatic community must consider what types of new capabilities and new partnerships will need to be developed to strengthen international cooperation concerning the digital space and how to engage the broader public uh, in this process and to address the growing concern over digital technology and its social and geopolitical consequences. Our discussion today is about linking the world of public diplomacy with the world of policy in the digital sphere. Indeed, this policy domain is one of the real grand challenges facing us. The other similar challenges that I can think of, for instance, uh, climate change. Uh, the other one is uh, nuclear disarmament or denuclearization. So these are all the real grand global transnational challenges uh, that we face in a policy arena. We are not going to delve into uh, the specifics on some of these policy matters per se, our focus today will be on exploring the frameworks 
for advancing digital cooperation through multi-stakeholder diplomacy and identifying the required organizational capabilities and the partnership mechanisms for future success. So we look forward to a very stimulating discussion. And to help us to kick off the program, I'd like to invite uh, from our Pew Research Center, Jacob Postak, Senior Researcher at the Pew uh, Research Center, to come up to the stage to uh, share with us some of the public opinion polling results uh, from Pew that uh, talks about what are the global publics uh, thinking, perceiving, uh, information technology in our everyday life? What are they thinking about the tech giants and uh, 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 all the uh, social consequences so that we can set up the stage uh, for uh, the discussion um, uh, after the, uh, the presentation? So, Jacob, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so I work at the Pew Research Center, and I'm going to take you through some slides um, that look at some of the data that we've collected over the years, both internationally and in the US itself. Uh, most of these are telephone and face-to-face uh, -face polling from countries around the world. And it will give us a little hint about what people think about these issues before we get to talk about them with the panel. So this is something that's a really uh, important basis for this discussion. You know, most people around the world are now using social media to gather news on a daily basis. Um, this includes both in advanced economies and emerging economies alike. So, you know, large percentage of the world, this is a, this is a change in how people gather news, how they access the news, and how they work in everyday lives to sort of understand what is going on around the world and how they use that in their um, daily actions. Uh, another interesting thing about the data that we find is that it's young people. These are the people who are more likely to be going online, the more likely to be using social media, uh, the more likely to be gathering news daily, daily from social media sites. So really, even though that you know, old people, young people uh, often both use social media, uh, it's really young people are the ones who are forging ahead and using this, these tools on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's an important understanding for how they think about the world. Another thing that we find in our data is that there's a strong correlation between trust in the news media and trust in the government. In other words, that people who trust those aspects of their life, people who say that they trust the news media, are more likely to have trust in, in their national government. So there's a trust factor here, too. If people don't trust uh, their government, and if they don't trust the news media, they tend to not to trust the other institutions. So we know that in, in the modern world, there's a lot of distrust in institutions, and these are often correlated across various sectors. Um, and then there's another issue that's sort of come up more recently is the impact of automation, the future of work. This is one of the concerns that publics around the world seem to consistently tell us about. So when we ask people whether robots and computers will eventually take the jobs of humans, we find large majorities in many of the countries we survey say that this is definitely going to happen. So people are not just concerned about uh, misinformation, distrust in the news media, they're also uh, worried about their own jobs. They're worried about their own income sources. Uh, one interesting thing about this slide here is that Americans are the least worried of the countries in which we surveyed. So only, but still 65% uh, say that this will happen and there are concerns about that. And the impacts of job automation, you know, what, what are going to be the downsides of it? And People say that they'll have a hard time finding jobs, that there'll be greater inequality between the rich and the poor. And this is consistent across all the countries that we surveyed, which includes more advanced economies, which are closer to more automation, and some of the more developing countries, which might be further away on this issue. But still, many people do not think that there's going to be as many potential upsides as there are downsides of the future of work. And what do they see as um, some of the upsides that we you know, potentially gave to them, that the economy would be more efficient or that there would be new, better paying jobs? And not many people across these countries agree that this will happen. Less than half think that these potential upsides of the future of work will be the case uh, when, when, when in 50 years when they think more robots and computers will have the jobs that humans currently do. So again, people are worried about these trends in the digital world, and they're worried about it for many reasons, and it's consistent across the countries in which we survey. 
Who do they expect to be responsible for this uh, new era of, of jobs? And in many cases, it's the government. Um, there are differences across the countries. You'll notice Americans do not have as much faith in the government to solve these types of issues as do people in the other countries we surveyed, uh, more individualistic uh, in many aspects. Uh, and, but people also think schools have a, a, um, an obligation to help uh, people find jobs in the future. Um, they also think that individuals themselves and employers, so you know, thinking about tech companies, you know, ordinary, ordinary companies, how, what they owe to their um, employees, um, many people think that they owe them, you know, if they replace their job with a robot, they owe them something. Um, and you see here, too, again, the individualistic nature of Americans sort of shines where 72% uh, of Americans say that individuals themselves are more responsible for um, making sure the nation's workforce force is prepared for a future where there's a lot of automation. So that's the story internationally. When you look at the US, this is when we get to more specific data about trust in technology companies and worries about uh, the future of the internet here. So you can see here, there's not much trust in technology companies. So 58% of majority say that you can trust technology companies some of the time, but you know only 28% uh, or so say that you can trust technology companies most all the time or most of the time. So there's not a huge amount of trust in the companies that are sort of forging forward in the new uh, in the new realm. And also, there's worries about tech companies' influence. We asked about a variety of companies and whether they have too much or too little influence in the US. And technology companies, 55%, say that they have too much influence in the world today. Um, and that's uh, you know, not, as, not as high as too much influence as pharmaceutical companies and banks and financial institutions, but not as positive as uh, you know, farms and small businesses. So there's still a lot of trust deficit when it comes to the technology companies within the US. And then when we talk about trust of protecting your data, you can see when we ask about various uh, industries, various uh, companies, and you know who controls the data, there's not a lot of confidence in either social media sites, so where the data is stored, or the federal government. So there's a lack of trust uh, and some of the most important uh, gatekeepers of this digital technology. And you can sort of see that this, this trickles down to overall views and trust in these institutions on an individual level. And when they do, even though th th there's a lack of trust and there, there's worries about the future of work, when, about the, 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 you know, the political setting we have now, there's a lot of distrust on partisan grounds. Uh, we know the US is very polarized when it comes to views of government, when it comes to views of, of, of climate change. You know, there's other issues where there's a strong partisan divide in the US. And here, it, it's, um, there's a widespread belief that social media platforms actually censor public opinion, especially among Republicans. So there's, there's also a distrust on the content that people are seeing. So all these combined is a pretty, you know, can be a pretty large uh, check against the, the technology companies. Um, and how does this uh, overall influence uh, views of the internet? Well, it hasn't, influ it hasn't changed it that much. People still say that the internet is good for society overall, but that number has actually fallen in recent uh, years, that fewer people now say that the internet is overall a good thing for society, and more people are now saying it is a bad thing for society in the US. So this is interesting to see that you know, all, all the various things that we've seen happen in the last couple of years have hurt overall the uh, views of the internet as a whole and whether it's, it's a good thing for humanity. And then finally, you know, what should we do about this issue? What, you know, we've seen all these problems, we've seen all the worries, and you know, Americans, we haven't asked this around the world, but in the US, you know, there's worries about the US government taking steps to restrict information. Obviously, fr freedom of speech is an important issue in the, in the US, and people are not yet sold on the fact that government can control these things. But they do see tech companies as playing a role in helping to mitigate some of the negative aspects of, the, of these various issues, misinformation, distrust, future of work. Uh, and so tech companies seem to be sort of the more trusted brand here when it comes to actually protecting people's information and sort of hel helping people use the internet in a way that's more prosperous towards society. So that's sort of the background of the data that we have at the Pew Research Center. Obviously, we have a lot more data on various topics. Um, and if there's something here that uh, you don't understand or want to hear more, you can go to our website, pewresearch.org. This is all publicly available information. And I appreciate it. And thank you for talk, uh, having me. And we'll have the next panelist. <laughs> thank you.
Thank you, Jacob. Uh, super interesting. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Jay. This is uh, an honor for me to be here uh, moderating this panel discussion, and I'm going to have the opportunity to introduce Fadi Shahadi, uh, who will set the scene for our larger conversation. I had the uh, privilege of working with Fadi and knowing Fadi when he was president of the International Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which, as you may or may not know, is the uh, independent global nonprofit that manages the infrastructure of the Internet and assigns names and numbers for, uh, for digital sites. So beyond that, I, uh, he was a true leader for what we've come to call the multi-stakeholder decision-making process and the multi-stakeholder internet community, uh, going on from ICANN to work closely with the World Economic Foundation and industry, as well as serving now on the United Nations high-level high panel on digital cooperation, and also working with academia through, the US, U, through USC and the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, I haven't seen Fadi in a long time, so I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, Fadi, I hope you're well. I hope you're there, and we're ready to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just testing audio and video uh, coming through well? Yes, sir. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, thank you first, Ambassador Sipovida, for your kind introduction. You're always generous, and I'm happy to hear your voice and look forward to see you again soon, hopefully in DC or in Los Angeles. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, the University of Southern California Public Diplomacy Institute for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, I am indebted to them in many ways, which I'll touch on. And I certainly offer my thanks to the Swedish embassy and frankly, the Swedish government for their leadership in this area uh, and in this world, uh, digital world we live in. So thank you all. Uh, I just will make one comment to link uh, uh, USC to this digital world. Uh, of course, many of you know that USC and UCLA, the two uh, key institutions here in Los Angeles, have been very involved in the creation of the digital world. And yesterday I was with uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles, when he reminded us uh, all that the very first email, not necessarily the one between heads of state, the very, very first email actually was sent from Los Angeles to Silicon Valley. And of course, I, I, I like to remind my friends in Silicon Valley of that. But most, uh, uh, most of this started um, uh, with the incredible minds of uh, people like uh, Dr. Khan and uh, Jay and, uh, of course, Steve Crocker, the past chairman of ICANN, and Vin Cerf, all of whom we're here in Los Angeles, uh, some of them high school friends, inventing a lot of what we are dealing with today. It's a great honor to be with you, and my apologies for not being there in person. This is the next best thing uh, due to family a family emergency. I had to stay back at home. I don't know where to start because, frankly, very little has to be said about digital today. If you open any newspaper, any morning, uh, any magazine, any media source, you will hear about the impact of digital in our lives. I jokingly say that cyberspace is dead because there is no such separate space anymore. All space has been permeated by the cyber revolution and the power of the internet. This is a fact. Um, today we have about 25 to 30 billion things that talk to the internet. By 2030, estimates go anywhere from one and a half trillion to some people saying even up to 50 trillion things will be connected to the internet. And that means if you look around you in your room, today there may be two, 3,000 things talking to the internet. You could multiply that by maybe a thousand uh, within 10 years. That means my eyes, my pacemaker, uh, possibly other parts of my uh, physical being, uh, my surroundings, the physical infrastructure around us, a lot of things will be connected to this network. I don't think we're well prepared for that advent, but it is going to happen. Every biological and physical infrastructure will be permeated by the digital fabric. When all of this happens, and I don't think it's far, 
I see it in a lot of the innovation I witness every day as a, an entrepreneur and an AI uh, person from the 80s. Uh, I'll tell you that it is upon us. And we just heard from the Pew Research Center earlier in the year in Davos. We heard also from uh, Richard Edelman uh, from Edelman Communications with the Trust Barometer. I think uh, uh, Jacob from Pew must have used the word trust at least 20 times. It's about trust now. And I think trust is diminishing. In fact, uh, the trust barometer of Edelman shows that trust in the digital world has started dipping seriously in the last two years. And that trend does not look good right now. Let's flip this coin just for a minute before I get into how diplomacy and governance could help us there. Many of you have traveled like me around the world. And whilst we in the developing world, uh, in the developed world, can sit and talk about the lack of trust and the issues we deal with every day, let me tell you that in many parts of the world, digital has brought the standard of living up in ways we could have never imagined. Some of the applications that we all talk about in East Africa have, according to a UN official, improved the lives of women in East Africa by spades and you know, many, many folds more than the entire efforts of the United Nations system over the last 50 years. So digital improves lives. It enables people to advance, to learn, to be educated. It breaks barriers. It does a lot of good things. And I don't need to preach this to all of you in this room. But somehow, we must find a new world, a new cooperation in this world, to ensure that digital remains a force for good and that where it can be used as a force to really bring down our society and our economy, that these forces can be harnessed in some way, can be managed in some way. I will show you a slide that I've used before many times. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Yep. This is a three-layer model that I've used before for several years to describe how we can together cooperate in this new digital world. And I divide the digital world into three layers. The infrastructure layer, or the green layer you see at the bottom, are all the networks that enable the digital world. Today, uh, some estimates are that we have about 78,000 networks that um, make- Excuse backwards. me for a second. Um, we can see, I don't know if that's a text box or if we don't see the slide itself. Oh, there we go, thank you. Okay. Okay, all right, wonderful. So that's essentially the infrastructure layer. And as I was saying, there are about 78 to 79,000 networks today in the world that make up this layer. Ambassador Sepulveda, who introduced me graciously, was one of the key people who over the years have helped shape the governance of that green layer. Uh, that layer is governed by international treaties, uh, by uh, standards that come out from the IETF, the IEEE, the ITU, a UN body, and one would argue, for the sake of today's discussion, that that layer, that infrastructure layer, is relatively well governed. There are some issues here and there, but in general, it's well governed. And we have systems to do it. The next layer, the orange or yellow layer, that is called the logical layer, is the one that I had the privilege of uh, looking after for four years when I was the CEO and president of ICANN. That's the layer that makes the 78,000 networks in the green layer and the billions of things connected to them look like one internet. Because there is no one internet. There are thousands of networks and billions of things. But somehow, every day we wake up and if we type www.ibm.com, it never goes to Hewlett Packard. It always goes to IBM and it has for the last 30 years. It never fails. And if you did that from South Africa or from Los Angeles or from Washington DC, 
you always get to the same machine that IBM calls IBM.com. That ability is enabled by this orange layer I'm going to simply call the logical layer. That's a layer that was invented by the founders of the internet, was established as an institution by the US government for the service of the world uh, back in the late 90s, and it became a nonprofit organization that through the leadership uh, of many countries, but especially of uh, President Obama, it became an independent layer governed by the multi-stakeholders that all come together in ICANN and enable that layer. So for the sake of this discussion, I could tell you that that layer, for all practical purposes, is now stably governed by all the stakeholders, governments, businesses, civil society, and it's working well, thank you. Now we come to this blue layer, and this is really where I think all of us know we're facing some real issues. So whilst I would argue there are systems of governance and cooperation around the green and orange infrastructure and logical layers, in the economic and societal layer, the one most of us live in, the most of us work in, there are no systems of governance that are working well today. There are very powerful companies that are deploying platforms across this blue layer. You know all of them. There are governments trying to bring some order to this layer, or uh, such as the EU uh, with their GDPR uh, proposal, which today we heard both Apple and Facebook suggesting we should find some equivalent for in the United States. Uh, there are also citizens that are increasingly active in trying to find some semblance of cooperation and of their voice being heard in this blue layer. So these are the three key stakeholders in this blue layer. But today, the power between these stakeholders, again, the governments, the businesses, and the citizenry, is not clear, and hence the issue. It used to be that governments, governments had some very clear jurisdictions to function in. And they could set laws and rules. And when things crossed between nations, they went to international organizations to set treaties. The internet was not built around the geopolitical borders that the national and international system built in the 19th and 20th century has set. The internet is a transnational resource. It is not an international resource and it is never a national resource. Now governments, as well as international organizations, are trying to make sense of this. Companies that operate platforms are not bound by many of these boundaries. And so this clash is what is causing the need for new mechanism that would constitute a cooperation system bringing these three stakeholders to agree together on how to solve these issues. This is not easy. It's very difficult. However, unless we together collaborate to find a path forward on how these three constituencies, these three stakeholders can cooperate on the many issues permeating this layer, we have a problem. So with this, I'm going to shift to the high level commission, the high level panel that the Secretary General has just formed. The Secretary General had asked me last year in November to address the executive board, which is the heads of all the UN uh, agencies in the world, to discuss the need for this. And as a result of that, he launched this important high level panel. The purpose of this panel is to advance the understanding of cooperation and how we're going to go about it between those three stakeholders. And this is very important, despite the fact this is indeed something uh, hosted and organized by uh, our Secretary General at the UN. He has made it very clear in the opening meeting uh, a few weeks ago in New York with our co-chairs, Melinda Gates and Jack Ma, that the UN does not intend to own this or to uh, dictate this but rather 
to be a convener enabling all stakeholders, especially business, civil society, and the citizenry, to come together with governments and figure out how to collaborate. I will leave you with some thoughts of mine on how potentially we could go from here. I do believe that we are very accustomed to highly horizontal systems of collaboration. Those are systems that are built top down using typical systems that we're used to in the national and international system. As Professor Anne-Marie Slaughter has said uh, in her book, New World Order, and her more recent book on the difference between networks and the chessboard, what we do need today in this networked age are not uh, vertical models, sorry, I misspoke earlier, but rather horizontal networks of cooperation that cut across our vertical systems of governance that we've built in the 20th century so that people can come together, experts can come together, practitioners can come together and address it at a uh, horizontal level. We need those experts to come together in a way that is distributed, it's not centralized, and that brings the people that need to solve the problems together. Platforms need to be uh, emerging, uh, and we have introduced at the World Economic Forum such a platform. We're now working on introducing a second one that would host those horizontal networks and enable them, because those horizontal networks need a home of sorts. But they must remain bottom-up efforts of experts that solve these issues. And then finally, there has to be some level of coordination between all those networks and all these platforms. Some of us in the community call them networks of networks. Again, loosely coupled, nothing top-down, nothing institutional, just frankly like this thing we all love called the internet. Highly distributed, loosely coupled. The governance of the internet and the digital space should look like the internet itself. Now, my colleagues at CPD would be, <clears throat> uh, I'd be remiss if I did not bring up the role of diplomacy and public diplomacy in making all of this happen. <clears throat> I do think that diplomacy is no longer the realm of governments. Uh, I was just approached by a major <clears throat> company in Silicon Valley asking me to help them find ambassadors for their company. I've never heard that term used in a, uh, in a corporate setting. But companies are realizing that they need not just lobbyists and public policy folks, they need actual ambassadors that help them practice diplomacy as companies across the world. I think governments need to also deepen their understanding of how to work with companies and platforms. And here I salute the government of Sweden for appointing, appointing the first ambassador to Silicon Valley. And I hope they also would consider soon appointing an ambassador to the Digital Valley here in Los Angeles, where a lot of content is being created, and around the world, where so much is being contributed to the digital lives. But that's what's needed. Governments need to see the transnational world beyond the national borders that their diplomats are trained in. Businesses, especially those that have transnational platforms, need to bring talent that can help them navigate the cooperation models and the horizontal models of the future that are not necessarily in the halls of vertical governance they're used to in the UN and other four. And finally, the citizenry needs to find a way to bring its voice into this cooperation system. And I dare to say that citizens need to use the internet itself to make sure their voice is heard and that they're not left out of the rooms where the powerful businesses and the powerful governments are actually making decisions on the protocols of the future. Digital protocols of the future need to be developed with all three constituencies at the table and schools, frankly, like CPD that I deeply value uh, and I'm a graduate of myself, 
have offered, continue to offer a good path forward for all of us to learn how to get there. With this, I'm going to hand it back to you, Ambassador Sepulveda, and I look forward to participate on the great panel you have assembled. Fadi, thank you very much. Very much appreciate uh, Very much appreciate hearing from you again and hearing your voice. Uh, let's get our panelists up and, and uh, move the agenda forward. Anywhere. So, because I worked with Fadi for four years, I understood literally every word he said. But I think that if I had no work with him for four years, I probably wouldn't. But what I would like to hear now is get sort of from you, first introduce yourself, and then give me your take on what you heard and what, what additionally you think needs to be said. Um, we have a 5.30 hard stop. It's 5.15. It no, okay, so... <laughs> We're standing between them and drinks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll go a little bit long, but I, I do want to open it up to questions as as soon as we can. But to start the conversation, uh, Fadi talked about the potential of. I I know that when when I was young, a long time ago, and we started working on these issues, we saw the internet and technology as a force for good, a democratizing force for both commerce and civic discourse. And he and Fadi clearly believes that's still the case. Do you still believe that's still the case? How, do, how can we make it more so the case? And then and maybe, Jacob, you can talk a little bit about how your research indicates whether or not people feel that's the case. I'll start. Uh, my name is Anthony Shop. I'm the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Social Driver, a digital agency in Washington, D.C., and I chair the National Digital Roundtable, which convenes policy uh, folks and innovators in digital. Um, and, and I do public diplomacy, citizen diplomacy work kind of in my volunteer life and with global ties. I, I love the title of this event, and I think it kind of shows us exactly where this challenge, and there's, a, there's an inherent contradiction. Public diplomacy, if you pull out your phone and you Google it, you're going to get a snippet from Wikipedia that says, in short, uh, the dissemination of propaganda. Okay, we don't like the word propaganda, but think of dissemination. I think traditionally that is what public diplomacy has been institutionally. It's a top-down getting information out. Now let's look at the second half of the title for the digital future. Not even future. What's the digital today? A digital mindset is the opposite. It's bottom-up. We heard a lot today about trust. Well, all the evidence says people trust institutions less, so then who do they trust more? The people who sit around them. That means that when it comes to vaccines, uh, people trust a parent more than a pediatrician. When it comes to news, whether that's true or fake, unfortunately, they trust a neighbor more than they trust the news media. So the digital world is bottom up and people trust those around them. And if you're used to disseminating information directly to an audience when they don't trust dissemination, you have to figure out how do I become part of the story that the neighbor and the parent is telling. In today's world, people are taking selfies and telling their own story. So how do I get in the other person's selfie with them, become part of their story? It's a totally different mindset. And I think that's the big challenge we face right now. And so when I imagine all the, you know, think about all the challenges we have today globally, um, it's not a problem with the technology. It's a problem with people and people who are too often embracing the approach of yesterday, bottom down, or excuse me, top down, and rather than thinking about the bottom up, up approach. When we see organizations doing that well, they succeed. And unfortunately, the ones that are succeeding tend not to be always the good guys, right? The folks making great videos that say vaccines uh, do these things that they don't do are not the institutions. They have wonderful, true information. They just happen to be PDFs on websites that nobody reads. So I think that's kind of the inherent contradiction in what we're facing today. That's great. And that's, I think that's a, a really interesting and, imp and important point in addressing how traditional institutions can address their mission and their task in new modern ways. And, and I know, I know more you, when we were colleagues at the State Department, you were engaged in that work for us at the State Department. If you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be sure. great. Sure. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name's Maura Whalen. I am uh, the founder of Blue Dot Strategies here in Washington, which is a consulting firm. Um, and Danny and I also work together at the State Department where I 
uh, was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Digital Strategy, which meant I oversaw the uh, the uh, the platforms of state depth, the the Twitter, social media. Uh, Instagram, all of our different social media platforms um, here out of Washington. Um, and it, I think one of the things that just kind of building on this conversation that I've noticed, uh, not just in the social media space, but also now in my role in working with companies is, is how much we've kind of moved beyond this initial phase of crashing the gates and institutions, both governments as well as companies, avoiding the limitations that, that were there and you know, companies saying we don't have to care about the government, we're just going to do it this way, we're going to have a new way of forget cabs and taxi commissions, forget hotel laws, we're going to do this our way, to sort of moving into a phase of cooperation. Um, and that didn't come you know, easily. This is definitely, um, you know, sort of being a young adult and growing up and realizing your parents aren't totally stupid. Um, but but we have to figure out a way to sort of save the benefits of the old way of doing things and the fact that there are institutions like governments that are looking out for individuals, but there are also innovations that are happening. And I do like, I you know, I see a lot of this just in the work we're, we're doing, whether it be small uh, nonprofits, governments, you know, big companies, sort of thinking differently about the way we do everything from uh, raising money, um, you know, I, I've been recently working with with uh, YouTube and uh, on a project of, of Love Army, a bunch of YouTubers that got together and raised money for the Rohingya, something to the tune of five million dollars overnight, and that money just went straight there. In the midst of USAID, CETA, every other organization continuing to do this work, people just moved forward and did it. Um, and you know they aren't YouTubers. They were literally a million people around the world deciding they were going to give five dollars or ten dollars. That's who made that decision, and that's that movement. So there's there's new ways we can envision this, and what we have to do is institutions is being open to the perspective. And I think that gets to my final point: is what we're learning in this new phase is that authenticity is really a key component. That we can't look to governments to act like a, a tech startup. We can't look to tech startups to have the concerns of government. What we need to do is sort of be authentically who we are and look for those points where we can cross over and build new things. Thank you very much. And Jacob, uh, you can take it from there in terms of the, the trust scenarios and, and whether or not this is a force for good or... Yeah, I'll try to keep it brief since I already had time to talk about the data. But two sort of countervailing uh, trends that we've seen lately is that, first of all, just more people now use the internet, uh, are on social media, own a smartphone. This has sort of been a radical change over the last 10 years. It used to be only in a sort of advanced economies, but now developing economies are actually catching up. Where there's the, you know, the digital divide has basically collapsed. Uh, across the world. So people are sort of learning these new uh, tools to do various things. And we've also found that while people trust in, in effect sort of the internet to improve lives in terms of education oppor educational opportunities, in terms of personal relationships, they definitely see some drawbacks when it comes to politics, when it comes to morality in general. So there are the downsides of technology that people are starting to see more and more harassment's another issue. Um, uh, you know, we had a recent survey that said a majority of teens, you know, deal with harassment online on a, a daily basis. So these are issues that for such a long time we were, we were talking about being more inclusive to technology, you know, growing these aspects of society, and now we're sort of coming to the more uh, negative aspects of it. And you sort of see it in that even though people around the world, you know, like these various things, they still generally use them in terms of personal relationships. They use it for texting, take, uh, you know, taking pictures, and sort of the, the recent changes that have happened and how campaigns are run and how people get their news from social media. I don't, these are things that, you know, people around the world have, 
you know, not yet learned to deal with. And it's sort of a question of how they're going to deal with these new aspects of the digital revolution that, you know, we didn't think about when we started studying these things 10 years ago. And we're going to have to come up with new questions, new ways of seeing how people are really, you know, interacting with the digital space around them and what type of tools we need to sort of help solve the problems that, you know, we see in our world today. Great. Uh, it is 525, and I want to make sure that we answer questions you have. I have thousands of questions that I could ask, but I want to make sure that you all are included in the conversation before we let you go for drinks. So please, if you could introduce yourself and make your question. Uh, digital, the, the digital revolution and all the things we're talking about are completely fragmenting people's ability to sustain attention to anything. And that seems to me in public diplomacy as anywhere to be a huge problem. And so do you see any, any of you see solutions to that uh, problem coming from um, the uh, sort of projects that you're working with or discussions that you're having of how we can kind of have get better go back to having more coherent sustained control over human thinking in the in in the public space uh, particularly more i think it's you're in the business of distributing ideas and information how, how do you deal with a fragmented attention economy well i mean i think that's 100 percent true we've seen it that you know the attention span of individuals has dropped significantly and then i would also say just having children you know you struggle to like teach them that one of the core things you can teach children at a young age is concentration right to be able to work through an entire process uh, whatever that might be um, but I think when you know we're talking about how that ends up affecting public diplomacy, what jumped to my mind was just how important convenings still are. Um, uh, the the kind of shtick we used to say when I was at the State Department was that uh, Secretary Clinton and Secretary Kerry were the most traveled secretaries of state in the world. Um, and were also the first ones to be on social media, right? That it wasn't a substitute, that these tools and this digital engagement, whether that's through commerce, through diplomacy, are not a substitute for actually coming together to search, to concentrate on the tough problems and work through, you know, sit for six weeks in a conference room to come up with the Iran deal. Um, and, and I think that we have to keep in mind that although we work to get better at digital, we also have to work to make sure we're still focusing on those interpersonal opportunities, um, to, especially on the government side, to, to keep things moving forward, that there's, there's just not a substitute for that. But you probably have thoughts on that, too. Well, my immediate instinct when you say that is, is absolutely, I'm glued to my phone. You know, I just did a research project in China for a month. I saw the same thing in China. But then I always think, well, what's the other side? What would others argue? And um, I work with some folks in the esports field, and I think they would say people concentrate on these video games for hours at a time. But there's a lot of overlap between the people who play video games and, and participate in esports and software engineers who spend hours. And we employ software engineers and web developers at my company, and they concentrate for hours on these projects. So I think to be an optimist, you could argue the concentration perhaps is shifting um, in some of those areas. And, but again, I still, from my own personal experience, I worry about it too. So I, I don't think we have any great answers to it, but I try to see the optimistic side. There, there is in the work that I've done, uh, both in the public sector and, the, and in the private sector, uh, a degree of concern about how the economy, or the digital economy particularly, funnels dollars to content and to the degree to which we are capable of funneling dollars to in, in, encourage the development of serious journalism and to to retain serious journalism as a part of what, if people are willing to give it their attention, it's available to them. And I think that that is a, a big part of the challenge that we need to solve both as a public and, and private group of people. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is uh, Osama Saleh. I spent about two years in the public sector at the World Bank. I just finished and transitioned into the, into the private sector, and I've been doing that for about two months. So my question for all of you is, uh, with the rise of new innovations and technologies and policies not yet in place for these new technologies, what are the incentives right, for the um, 
for the private sector to cooperate with the government or vice versa? Um, having been on both sides of this question now in both the private sector and the public sector, there is a, a mutual incentive to cooperate. From the, from the private sector side, you want to make sure that you're addressing problems to the degree that you can so that regulation and law doesn't have to impose solutions on you and that you can continue to drive and create wealth and deliver your products the way, the way you wish. And from the public side, you don't want to, at least in the United States in particular, you don't want to look like you're bringing the heavy hand of government into the free market process and asking people to you know, ask permission for the creation of services. So it's a, it's a careful balancing act. Um, so today, for example, you see companies, Apple was named today, Facebook and others are coming out in support of a national privacy law. That's in large part as a reaction to a California privacy law that was recently passed. So when companies see that, all right, a state like California, which is 30% of the market, creates a law, we're going to have to comply with it. Maybe we can work with the federal Congress to create a law that is not weaker or stronger, but works better for the economy as a whole and applies to everyone in the economy. Uh, so that's just one example. There's, it's usually a sticks and, sticks and carrots kind of situation. I, I think I also saw that in government, it was almost more realized by the private sector that there was incentive to cooperate than, than from the public sector. And by that I mean, you know, we, I would regularly have conversations with Twitter or other organizations and we'd ask questions about like, well, what about translating? Because right now I have to put a tweet in nine different languages and send it around the world and we have to manually tweet this stuff. What about your translation systems? And what we would find is when we ask questions like that, they would take that back and put their engineers on it because we were asking a question that any other transnational organization was going to ask. That, you know, just because we were the kind of first ones thinking about that, we could serve as a, as a resource for them on, on very practical questions. But one of the barriers I found is that inside of government, it sort of, it, it tends to speak to itself very well. Um, and speak to other governments very well, um, but it doesn't they don't think outside of that. So, for instance, um, LinkedIn came to me one time was like, "Listen, we have all this data, and you know we can help you predict where uh, certain economies are growing or dropping." And it was obvious, right, to anybody I think in this room who has interest in that. You're like. You had me at hello. Obviously, you could be much more predictive and immediate than governments who are depending on last year's census or income tax returns or tax, you know, uh, tax payments who are who are creating policies because of outdated data versus LinkedIn, which knows where people are going for jobs or who doesn't have jobs anymore and all of that kind of information. But trying to translate why that would be of use inside of government. I mean, I don't know what you experienced, but that was kind of a challenge to, to get people to see this is here, use it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, I, I'm Mindy Reiser. I want to raise something we haven't touched on yet. And that is the whole dimension of exchange programs. The United States Information Agency, before it was folded into the State Department, was very much focused on that. I worked for the Fulbright Program, and the Institute for International Education is spearheading that. We have, of course, all sorts of digital ways of connecting. We have uh, programs that are mediated by all sorts of uh, electronic uh, devices, uh, video conferences, and so on. So where do you see this going? A great deal of government money is going into exchange programs. Have they been bypassed or overshadowed by digital technology, or are they still very vital? Jacob, I think it's a perfect question yeah. for you, actually. Perfect. Well, I've participated in a lot of exchange programs. I'm a trustee for People to People International and on the Board of Global Ties, so I, I'm a little biased. I think People to People exchanges are irreplaceable. But um, I think there's a big opportunity to enhance those through digital technology. I fear, I mean, kind of connecting back to the last question about the cooperation, I fear that the mindset of government is not always uh, bringing the best solutions to bear. I, um, uh, I, I studied abroad in college, met a friend from Sweden, actually, on that trip. Thanks to digital technology, we were able to stay in touch. 
I attended his wedding in Sweden. He attended my wedding in the United States. So some great citizen diplomacy happening there. When I look at what the method is for a lot of the programs, uh, many different programs and fellowships are kind of setting their own private social networks and intranets up. And you know, I don't know about you, but most people don't need another website to have a password to, so they fail. They have people sign up under duress, and they never go back to those websites. But guess what? Every day they're on Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever they happen to be. And um, the way government's mindset operates is that we want to control all of this, so we're going to create this private community for everyone to come interact. And unfortunately, I can tell you from the professional roles I have on boards, and I can tell you from being a participant in some of these programs, I haven't seen any that are particularly, some have minor success, none of them are very successful. So I, I'm really hoping that government will be able to adopt a mindset to enhance the people-to-people -people exchange programs, which are amazing. The International Visitors Leadership Program that the State Department has is a tremendous program. I interned for the Visitors Council in Kansas City in high school and have stayed involved for almost 20 years. So it's just a fantastic program, um, but we're not tapping into the potential to use digital technology to connect people and to amplify those experiences as much as we can. We're doing it a little bit, but I think it's a mindset shift. It, we have to go to that bottom up and use the platforms people are already on. Moira, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and there are great opportunities there. What I always talked about was using those opportunities of in-person events to broaden the room, right? Because there's always more people that you want involved. And I think the other thing that I would just to augment, governments have to be willing to give up their dictation of what their broadcast you know, tendency and embrace that that engagement aspect um, that social media allows. And, you know, we really tried to do that in uh, like the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, which was my sort of mic drop last government hurrah in Silicon Valley. We really tried to push seeing this event with President Obama and Mark Zuckerberg and Sergey Brin and all of these people, not through the broadcast eye that we were bringing to it, but through the eyes of the participants and the entrepreneurs who were there um, to experience it and do that not just digitally through what they were putting on Facebook and Twitter, but to go back to the embassy, have events at the embassy with people who couldn't participate and let them be the messengers, let them talk about uh, talk about it rather than us talking about it. Yeah. And you had to sort of be brave and a risk taker in some ways inside of government probably to make that happen. We and had to teach them how. Yeah, <laughs> but there's some good success, bright spots there that I think we can do more of. Do more of. Yeah, Moira sure. was very shy, so we had to get her out yeah. of her shell first before. <laughs> we'll take one more question and then uh, close it up. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you all for being here. I want to tie into a point that Anthony just made as well as to some points that Fadi made in his remarks and also kind of broaden the geographical and chronological aperture of the discussion, particularly about the points of uh, uh, horizontalizing the, uh, that, uh, you know, that, those layers that were on the screen, particularly the blue layer, and the di talking about the discussion of governments determining what social platforms or networks people use. That's failed in the United States time and time again, whether it's government, whether it's educational universities, as you point out. But it is succeeding other places, particularly authoritarian nations, particularly China being one. And they have social networks that are widely used across the you know billion plus people that they have that are, if not under the control of the government, certainly under the surveillance of the government. And so that model does exist. And is there a fear, that, or at least an awareness of the possibility that we may wind up with some kind of digital uh, iron curtain between societies which are open and have these kinds of uh, open con connections and networks and the good and bad that comes with that? And on the other side of that iron curtain, authoritarian, huge countries with, you know, people numbering in the billions where they essentially don't have those kinds of networks and connections. And then you have all sorts of geopolitical, social, economic problems that stem from that. And I know that's kind of a massive question to ask. So, I, I so actually, you know, yeah, go for it. 
do what uh, you can. This was a huge issue when I was at the State Department, and it was a hot topic of conversation at the United Nations and in, in our multi, multilateral negotiations and gatherings. Uh, China is a fairly unique statistical outlier due to, the, due to its size and its connectivity. Um, there really aren't a lot of markets who can pull that off, uh, maybe none. Uh, the other markets of scale where that could happen would be like Indonesia or India or Brazil, and none of them are inclined either as a function of po politics or political philosophy or, or economic design to do that. You see other nations try to do something similar like a Cuba or an Iran um, or Russia, which is probably the most comparable to, to a China, like a Cuba and, a, and a, an Iran. They just can't build at scale. They don't have a connectivity sufficient enough, an audience large enough to serve, and an internal innovation engine large enough to be to make a huge difference in that sense. So I, I worry about it for the people of China, right? I mean, that we believe that the universal human rights apply to all humans regardless of where they live. And the, the, we had the, our arguments before the United Nations was whether or not a sovereign entity had a right to deny people freedom of expression or association within the four corners of their, what they would call their own intranet. Um, and that's an ongoing sort of debate and discussion that we've been having and will continue to have for, for you know, I think many years. But, uh, but at this point, we believe that, or at least I believe, and we believed in the Obama administration, that the, that the underlying uh, engagement and exchange of ideas and communication, the tool that the internet had become to be, uh, to use for the exercise of freedom of association, for the exercise of freedom of expression, was an inherently good tool, something that we wanted to encourage. Uh, what we've seen is uh, without curation, without education, without serious attention, it's a tool that can be used for bad as well as good. And that the, the, tack, the, the challenge now is how do we deal with that third layer, the blue layer that Fadi talked about, where you have a combination of social, technical, and economic issues coming into play. And I think the Swedish embassy, just since we're here to close, uh, Carl Bildt, what, uh, who was mentioned earlier, was, is one of the thought leaders in the global community on these issues. And uh, in working with not just the, the Swedish embassy, but our colleagues in Europe, um, bringing together all of our values and trying to bring together all of our minds from the public sector, the private sector, civil society, uh, it, it's the only way we're going to get to yes on, on these issues. And think about this in a horizontal way. Richard Haas has talked about a world in disarray and the next World Order 2.0 in which you have Institutions like the United Nations that still play an incredibly significant function in society, but have to be open to other stakeholders in ways that are much more equitable than they have been historically. So I think with that, it's been an enjoyable discussion. Monica, thank you very much for having me.